Hi, I'm Christopher Annadale. I've tracked down some of my former students to ask, is there life after philosophy? Welcome to Life After Philosophy. My guest today is John Zaleski. John works as a government accountant in Pennsylvania. He earned a Master of Arts in Philosophical Studies degree in 2017 from Mount St. Mary's University. He is recently married and has an infant son. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, John, now you were someone who worked in accounting. You had your job in government finance prior to entering seminary. You came into Mount St. Mary's Seminary, were here with us doing classes and discernment for a couple of years. You discerned out of seminary, went back into the work world as an accountant and finance guy, met your wife, got married. You guys have a son now. Congratulations. Thank you. You've got, I think, a unique perspective on what life is like in the work world, both before and after the formal study of philosophy. I wonder if you could share some ideas about that with us. Well, I've encountered philosophy, I mean, throughout my life. I mean, there's a philosophy in everything. College, I got into libertarian philosophy, read Ayn Rand, uh, went down that rabbit hole. After college, I got into Catholic apologetics and uh, got into the back door of philosophy that way. It really fascinated me. And I, I started learning about the formation of Catholic priests philosophy, theology, that sort of thing. And it really, really fascinated me. And uh, I eventually went into seminary to discern the call to the priesthood. So seminary, seminary for men who don't have a philosophy background begins with two years of philosophy study. I know you took some of those classes with me. I remember that back in 2014, 2015. What was your experience like coming from the work world? You, see, you read some libertarian philosophy, read some Catholic apologetics. You come in, you're dropped into a classroom with a bunch of other guys, other seminarians and some non-seminarians, and you're studying philosophy with Dr. Annadale or somebody else. What's that transition like? It It's certainly different. I mean, seminary is very structured as far as going to mass, uh, having an evening prayer. But as far as philosophy, that's... A much more interesting topic than uh, government accounting or corporation taxes. The interesting conversations had between seminarians and philosophy students and uh, in the classroom was so engaging and such a delight for me. It was much more worthwhile than the job I had in government. <laughs> I can say that. And even after leaving seminary and uh, studying philosophy, I, I again took a job with the government because it seems to be in line with Catholic social teaching to the extent that there's reasonable work-life balance. I can work the job and support a family. That was my thought behind it. It goes back into virtue ethics. Like, What is the best way to live? What is excellence? So, yeah, that's... that's uh, that's what comes to mind when I think about philosophy before seminary and then after seminary. How is it applied? What is applied philosophy in my own life? What, what does that look like? And so from considering things, from learning how to think better in seminary and through philosophy, is able to make different decisions after seminary in philo using philosophy, that is. I asked you a moment ago about the transition from the work world into the classroom, and it's a transition from working in accounting to philosophy, so classroom philosophy with other people, and maybe there's this kind of grand sweep of ideas. What's the what's the transition out like? I know this is connected with your, your leaving seminary, discerning out of seminary. Are there any bright line comparisons between life life after studying philosophy, life before studying philosophy, or you already seem like you're a pretty pretty philosophically aware guy, and and even you know moderately well read before before coming in. Philosophy wasn't completely new to you, is that right? Uh, you could say that, but I studied bad philosophy before seminary, and I 
studied much better philosophy in seminary and some bad philosophy as well. But well, there's that, there's no point in studying the good unless you have some of the bad along with it to 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 highlight it. Right. Absolutely. Got to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. You mentioned so, you mentioned making ahead. better decisions. I wonder if that's if that's something that sort of if you think of your some of your decisions since leaving since finishing the philosophy degree five or six years ago that maybe were informed by virtue ethics or some of your formation in philosophical hopefully moving towards the kind of philosophical wisdom do you do you feel wiser i do i do feel wiser uh, because i love wisdom i'm a philosopher maybe a low-level philosopher but uh, nevertheless we're we're all students of philosophy we're just just different different stages on the journey right yeah i would say going from studying philosophy to the work world it's definitely an adjustment there aren't as many interesting conversations accounting can be repetitive and dull at times and that can't not affect the person performing the accounting and the culture of workplace now this is interesting because a lot of people would say philosophy is repetitive and dull or that it's uh it, it, it's kind of removed from the actual business of you know making sure that the economy functions well that people get paid that the audits are complete is it you're speaking of of philosophy somewhat nostalgically in the sense that it, it looks like it's got this 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 meaning for you that people don't necessarily find in in the work world or at least maybe in the accounting in the accounting world what is behind that do you think do you think i think before studying philosophy i was looking for meaningful work putting that possibly as an idol or something like that I had a dream of becoming an international businessman focusing in the Americas because I had studied Spanish in college and I was studying Portuguese and I was taking accounting classes after graduating from Penn State, but before going into seminary to prepare for the CPA. So I wanted to get all these credentials so that way I could get some high power business job that may or may not exist. And at the end, it just seems a bit futile because that that is not going to bring me ultimate happiness and that's that's a classic philosophical question what will make me happy and that goes back to aristotle's nicomachean ethics so it, it's brought me to a change of focus the accounting jobs that i've had have been a little repetitive not that it's a bad thing mm -hmm. uh, it's not as challenging as i would like like what is the proper job for a person okay i enjoyed philosophy because it was intellectually stimulating and it was something that brought me closer to god to happiness it philosophy is the handmaid of theology yeah I, I have had an interesting job where i was an expert witness with the public utility commission and we, we had to write testimony and i was put on the stand twice and that was that was interesting because I had to engage my writing faculties and maybe I didn't use philosophy as strongly as I, as one might think, but it was interesting having some conversations within the Bureau, like how do we handle this? How do we uh, adjust for this claim that the company is making? How do we put this into writing when how do we argue this when they come back in rebuttal and I have to write sir rebuttal? How do I handle questions when I put on the stand? These sort of things. You know, it sounds like you, you, you've mentioned the kind of repetition in the job. And I mean, if, if I'm going from my own sort of stereotypical ideas of accounting, I think of, you know, people in the Dickens, you know, movie and you know, Christmas Carol sort of filling in the, the clerks filling in the numbers in the, uh, in the ledgers. It sounds like a kind of it sounds it like non-philosophical. It does sound like it's it's kind of work day and a little bit of a grind. But is there you mentioned giving up the fantasy, the the sort of idea of meaningful work. And I think a lot of young people are sort of interested in this idea 
of work that's sort of deeply meaningful and significant. Is there a new appreciation that you have for the kind of human life that you live, flourishing, trying to flourish, with the kind of work that you do? One wouldn't want to say that you you settled, but do you have a, do you have a way of thinking about it that you think is uh, is is healthier than than the the settling that I just mentioned? Yes, I think it has something to do with living a well ordered life, prioritizing the right things. Like work is a means to an end. It's it's man's curse. It's it's, it's what. I mean, what would I do other than working? If I had millions of dollars, I would still work. I would still work. I would do something to help make the world a better place. I wouldn't find my ultimate fulfillment in work because that's, well, ultimate fulfillment would be in God. But, um, but yeah, I mean, philosophy has helped me prioritize certain ideas that I had previously. It's like, okay, meaningful job where my talents are utilized, where it's challenging enough for me to use my brain or use my body if I'm doing physical labor or something like that. But yes, uh, it, it has a function. It has a purpose. It's uh, the job that I have is, it has utility. It has utility. It supports my family, yeah. pays the bills. There's a nobility, of course. Yeah. Sometimes we speak about philosophy as giving people a kind of self-knowledge or self-possession. Is that something that you've that you felt? Is, is it was it? I mean, I realize you you just did two years of philosophy, maybe a little bit of theology, and then discerned out of seminary and pursued a different path. But were, were there things you learned about yourself? You think in in studying and reflecting on the the kind of philosophy education you had. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, studying philosophy is useful in learning how to think. Writing is useful in that it helps helps the person to think better. I like to think of it as a comb going through hair where there's knots in the hair. And you drag and you pull and it hurts and you have to get th certain things straightened out. But when it's done, it's it's clear, it's coherent, it's um, well-ordered. And in another way, I think it really brought the room together in my in my mind. Like, like the dude's rug, yeah. It, it brought the, exactly. It tied, the, tied the whole room together? Exactly. It, it's funny, I, my next question I was going to ask about integration is, is, do you feel you live a, a more integrated life? Like, what, what could that mean? How could we even explain that to somebody who's not even, who, who's thinking about studying philosophy a little bit more deeply and would like to know about sort of what you get at the far end out of it. I say, well, I live a more integrated life. I have better priorities. I can assign work its appropriate place in a well-ordered life. How would, how would you go on to characterize that still further? Great question. <laughs> Take your time. Okay. Well, we're thinking out loud here that, 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 that can't be done on a, on a, on a rigid timetable. So, I had a business education in college, and that's fine. It taught me more about business, but it didn't teach me as much about life, about what what is virtue, what does that look like. I did enjoy learning uh, the philosophy of economics. So tell me about that. What was that like? What was the, where was the value in that? Do you think? Well, the law of supply and demand. There's there's graphs and it's based on humans reacting to incentives or responding to incentives in that way it's very human i don't know why is the price of gasoline increasing is the quantity is the supply curve shifting to the left is there a greater demand for it what in the world is going on to contribute to these things that we see in the economy. And it would be more, more of a macroeconomic thing. 
Yeah, you relate this to uh, to philosophy, you said philosophy of economics. Right. I mean, learning economics, there's a philosophy behind it. There's a philosophy behind almost anything. So one of the prime assumptions of economics is that the person is rational. Yeah, I wonder. It, it's interesting also to note that that that's then all of the conclusions of economics are based upon that assumption. That if we were to set that assumption aside, we'd be doing something other than economics. Exactly. Do you find that and back to the integration idea? Do you find that you're able to to move between different areas of your life or different ways of thinking more easily because you've had this sort of larger framework that you've been working on in terms of thinking about a life of virtue? A life well lived. Yes, yes. I know you're feeding me good questions here. I just feel like I'm on the spot here. But... That's okay. Yeah. Take your time. Like I said, we, we we don't we don't we we think out loud. We we think at our own pace. Yeah, maybe I'm a bit of a slower thinker here, but it's fine. That's okay. That, that's why philosophy requires writing, so that way you can put your thoughts on paper, strain them out eventually get to a good product. Right. Um, well, think of this as a sort of, this is a sort of impromptu dialogue, right? I'm, I'm standing in for Socrates and you, you're John. We'll, uh, we'll talk until we, until we figure out what we find, what we figure out. Sure. We'll know what we know and what we don't know. Yeah. So integrity. Yeah. Becoming one. Uh, everything is related. I can, can't steal from the cash till and then also be a good person elsewhere. It, yeah, you suppose people are like that. I mean, is that is that is that terribly common? People trying to trying to live multiple lives, stealing from the cash till, still being a good person everywhere else. I, I've had a lot of experience with uh, people in my life who try to put on a good show and pretend like they're good when behind the scenes they're doing bad things yeah i don't want to delve into uh no of course not details but i think that's a very common thing these things happen we live in a fallen world again yeah. that's a philosophical maxim maybe a theological maxim well again given that assumption we can think through what what the consequences are of of the fall yes we need, the way we need to live and, and relate to each other Exactly. If, if I may, let me ask you about another transition in your life. You were uh, in Catholic seminary for several years. Now you're a married man with uh, a young baby. What was the transition like from seminary discernment to sort of post-seminary, from being a single guy to being a married guy? I'm saying this as somebody who's who's got four kids and has been married for 25 years. Was Was there any sort of perspective that you're you have on your philosophical formation you're thinking about virtue and the good life that relate to that change in in your life and in you personally right because in seminary and then for several years after seminary i was single and i was living a life where virtue consisted of only the life i was living yeah i made mean, sure i would you know live among other people and uh interact but now it's it's a family unit, and what does that look like? What is the best way to live family life? It's been a learning curve, but it's been good, knowing that we need to be on the same page. Something that has fascinated me has been Dave Ramsey. He's a Protestant money guy. Yeah, yeah. I know who? Yeah, he takes uh, you know concepts from say the Proverbs and elsewhere. Uh, from Christian theology and Jewish theology. And he takes some pretty common sense things and puts them into a workable system to deal with money. And that's been very good for my wife and me to get on the same page on money. So that way we're working together for common goals. Because uh, we don't live individual lives anymore and by ourselves we live lives together we also have a child that we need to raise together and we yeah. need to figure out how how that works this is our first one 
how how do we best raise this child? It's a uh, yeah, it's it's a learning curve. My my wife will often uh, say that there is no preparation for it other than doing it. Really, like in the deepest sense, you can't know what it's going to be like, and you you have to you have to suffer through it. You have to you have to do the work on a day by day basis, year after year, of of building a marriage and you know cutting and shaping yourself and and responding to your spouse's needs and thinking through what 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 your children need, what the household need, what the household needs are, and how to provide for them. Exactly. Something somebody said to me, a, a philosophy teacher of mine said something to me about having children. Maybe this is something that'll be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. It stuck with me for, for a long time now. He said that when you get married, you go from being, of course, being single to being a pair. But there's still a kind of, I might say, kind of affinitude to this. There's still It's still me and my gal, right? It's the two of us against the world, right? There, there's right. there's you know, me and my wife. But then there's us. But when the when the child enters the picture, you you become aware of that there's this. I, I think something Hegel says that the child is the death of the parent. If Hegel didn't say it, he should have. It seems very Hegelian. <laughs> in 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 and this is this is true. I maybe maybe your experience is like this. Maybe it's not. But my experience certainly was holding my child. I'm feeling that here is here is death for me. All right here here oh. is the end of my existence for myself. And the beginning of my existence for him and for them, and there's a, there's a way in which you you acquire maybe kind of a vertical dimension or an, an increased depth to yourself and to your marriage. That the way my teacher put it was that you you enter into history for the first time if you haven't already when you have a child. That mm -hmm. it can't be me and my gal anymore. It's not just me and her and the baby. The baby calls forth something new from me. It calls, you know, I, I have to have now a sense of who I am and who we are and of, of where we came from and where we're going to. Uh, par pardon me if I'm speaking kind of obscurely or if I seem like I'm, I'm kind of being, okay. being mystifying, but there really is a sense in which you, if you haven't done it before, you have to have a life story when you have a baby because you have to think, what are we going to tell the baby about our lives, our history. Mm -hmm. I can't live in the present moment anymore, even as a pair, as one of a pair of people. Now I have to be somebody who's sort of going somewhere, who's got a kind of historical trajectory, backwards and forwards in time. Pardon me for getting real philosophical there, you know, right on on the it. air. What do you think of that? Does that does any of that resonate with experiences that you've had emotionally or in terms of your own personal growth since becoming a married man and becoming a father? Definitely. There, there's something to be said for a young single man who lives in the moment, can do anything, can live a life fairly aloof. And then there, there's something to a man sacrificing, you could say freedom, that aloofness, the ability to do many things or anything that one would like, a traveler or, or whatever. Yeah. And living a more well-directed life. So it, perhaps it could be like into a, a stream with banks leading towards uh, a city. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it definitely directs the, the energies and efforts. And now, it, now I'm looking at providing for my, for my wife and my son. Like, what do I do? with my energies and my efforts, how do I best provide for my family? I believe St. Paul talks about that somewhere. Yeah. Where, you know, the man has to worry about pleasing the wife. And uh... <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, I, I'm praising the married man by saying, you know, he's the, the, the man with the child is, is sort of has a, has a different, has a deeper sense of self than the single guy St. Paul is praising the single guy because he's fully available for the Lord. He doesn't care about the things of this world. I, I don't know that we're talking necessarily at cross purposes. I'm, I'm not. It, I hope we're not directly opposed to each other. But now here, you're somebody who's lived who's lived both lives: the life of somebody preparing to serve the Lord and to, to give himself to the church, and the life of somebody who's sort of 
I might say deeply rooted in the world, but the way I was saying it also kind of deeply rooted in, in his own sense of history and selfhood. Yeah, there's a certain kind of self-knowledge that I think parenthood calls forth in a man and in a woman. I don't know if that resonates or perhaps I'm just sort of telling my own story using using a certain kind of philosophical vocabulary. What, what, what do you think? Does this does this make sense or or not? I think there's something there. I think there's definitely something to that. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> you spoke earlier about this kind of youthful desire you had for meaningful work and this being maybe one of the one of the illusions or fantasies you gave up when you got a little bit further along in life. I wonder what kind of meaning you found in your life now as a family man and how that maybe has transformed your sense of vocation in the work that you do to provide for your wife and child. I would say it's definitely helped me direct my efforts instead of just kind of shooting in the dark, like, oh, I can do go here, I can go there, I can do this, I can drive down to Augusta, Georgia to visit an old priest friend of mine, or... Mm -hmm. I can uh, fly to Rome with uh, seminarians or something like that. We can do uh, almost well, across half the country on a road trip or something like that. That would sound like fun. Now it's like, now I, I strive to serve my family. The question that I should be asking is, does this help the family? Does this please my wife? Is this raising my son well? Is this good for myself? Am I, am I emotionally and physically healthy? Am I doing the right thing right now? There's many people who comment on Matthew Kelly, but I, I read some of his books. Yeah. And I always, get, I always get nuggets out of there. Like, just do the right thing. Just do the next right thing. And his, uh, the way he condensed... Lumen Gentium's universal call to holiness is become the best version of yourself. And it's very practical. I mean, I, I'm not reading great theological or philosophical works anymore. I, frankly, I don't have time for it, but there's a very utilitarian or practical purpose to, you know, reading something, mm -hmm. something for, you know, anyone to pick up with a wide audience. Yeah, is this is this helping my family become the best version of itself? Is uh, this helping my wife? Is this, yeah, that's great. I really appreciate that. That's a good way to good way maybe for us to wrap up. I appreciate your time today, John. I know you had to take time out of your schedule to to come talk with me. I really appreciate you agreeing to appear on the podcast. My guest today has been John Zaleski. He is an accountant, a husband, and father living in Pennsylvania. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Life After Philosophy. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate it five stars and share this episode with a friend. I appreciate your support.